Hello, everyone, and welcome to this, the Algonquin Public Library's teen new book announcement video series, Get Yeti to Read. Um, for this video, I will be highlighting all of the new teen books that we got in January. So let's get right on into it. First up, we have Historical. Last Night at the Telegraph Club. That book, it was about two women and they fell in love with each other. And then Lily asked the question that had taken root in her and even now was unfurling its leaves and demanding to be shown the sun. Have you ever heard of such a thing? 17 year old Lily can't remember exactly when that question took root, but the answer was in full bloom the moment she and Kathleen walked under the flashing neon sign of a lesbian bar called the Telegraph Club. America in 1954 is not a safe place for two girls to fall in love, especially not in Chinatown. Red Scare paranoia threatens everyone, including Chinese Americans like Lily. With deportation looming over her father, despite, despite his hard-won citizenship, Lily and Kath will risk everything to let their love see the light of day. The Awakening of Malcolm X. A very powerful fictionalized account of Malcolm X's adolescent years in jail that happens to be written by his daughter. The Great Gatsby graphic novel adaptation. This takes F. Scott Fitzgerald's great American novel and displays it in a vivid new format. Painted in lush watercolors, the inventive and inter interpretation emphasizes both the extravagance and mystery of the characters, as well as the fluidity of Nick's unreliable narration. Excerpts from the original text wind their way through the illustrations and imagery and metaphors are taken to the literal and often whimsical extremes, such as when a beautiful party goer blooms into an orchid and Daisy pushes Gatsby across the sky on a cloud. With its timeless critique of class, power, and obsession, this adaptation captures the energy of an era and an enduring re resonance of one of the world's most beloved books. The Angel of Greenwood. 17-year-old Isaiah is on the surface a town troublemaker, but he is hiding that he is an avid reader and secret poet, never leaving home without his journal. A passionate follower of W.E.B. Du Bois, he believes that Black people should rise up to claim their place as equals. 16-year-old Angel is a loner, mostly disregarded by her peers as a goody-goody. Her father is dying and her family's financial situation is in turmoil. Also, as a follower of Booker T. Washington, she believes through education and tolerance that Black people should rise slowly and without forced conflict. Though they've attended the same schools, Isaiah never has noticed Angel as anything but a dorky Bible-toting church girl. Then their English teacher offers them a job on her mobile library, a three-wheel, two-seater bike. Angel can't turn down the money, and Isaiah is soon eager to be in such close quarters with Angel every afternoon. But life changes on May 31st, 1921 when a vicious white mob storms the community of Greenwood, leaving the town destroyed and thousands of residents displaced. Only then, Isaiah, Angel, and their peers realize who their real enemies are. This novel was inspired by the true events of the Greenwood Massacre. Horror. Don't tell a soul. All Bram wanted was to disappear from her old life, her family's past, and from the scandal that continues to haunt her. The only place left to go is Louth, the tiny town of the Hudson River where her uncle James has been renovating an old mansion. But James is haunted by his own ghosts. Months earlier, his beloved wife died in a fire that people say was set by her own daughter. The tragedy has left James a shell of the man Bram once knew and destroyed half the house he so lovingly restored. The manor is creepy and so are the locals. The people of Louth don't want outsiders like Bram in their town. And with each passing day, she's discovering that the rumors they spread are just as disturbing as the secrets they might hide. Most frightening of all are the legends that tell about the dead girls, girls whose lives were cut short in the very house Bram now calls home. Hold back the tide. Here are the rules of living with a murderer. One, do not draw attention to yourself. Of course, when you live with a murderer, this is pretty impossible. Even the subtlest of specters is bound to be noticed, which leads to the next rule. Two, if you can't be invisible, be useful. Everyone in the quiet lakeside community knows that Alva's father killed her mother all those years ago. There wasn't enough proof to arrest him though. And with no other family, Alva has been forced to live with her mother's murderer, doing her best to survive until she can earn enough money to run away. One of her chores is to monitor water levels in the lock 
a task her father takes very seriously. Their family has been watching, has been the guardian of the lock for generations. It's a cold, lonely task, and a few times Alva can swear that she hears that she feels someone watching her. But the more Alva investigates, the more she realizes that the truth can be more monstrous than lies, and that you can never escape your past. Mystery and Thriller. Playing with Fire. Natalia is not the kind of girl who takes risks. Six years ago, she barely survived the house fire that killed her baby brother. Now she is cautious and always plays it safe. For months, her co-worker Wyatt has begged her to come hiking with him, and Natalia finally agrees. But when a wildfire breaks out, blocking the trail back, a perfectly sunny day quickly morphs into a nightmare. With no cell service, few supplies, and no clear way out of the burning forest, a group of strangers will have to become allies if they are going to survive. Girls I've Been. Nora has been a lot of girls. As the daughter of a con artist who targets criminal men, she grew up as her mother's protege. But when her mom fell for a mark instead of conning him, Nora pulled the ultimate con, escape. For five years, Nora's been playing at normal, but she needs to dust off the skills she ditched because she has three problems. One, her ex walked in on her with her girlfriend. Even though they're all friends, Wes didn't know about her and Iris. Two, the morning after Wes finds them kissing, they all have to meet to deposit the fundraiser money they raised at the bank. It's a nightmare that goes from awkward to deadly because, number three, right after they enter the bank, two guys start robbing it. Every single lie. Nobody in 16-year-old Beckett's life seems to be telling the whole story. Her boyfriend, Jake, keeps hiding texts, which, he, which could mean he's cheating on her. Her father lied about losing his job and so much more before his shocking death. And everyone in school seems to be whispering about her and her family behind her back. But none of that compares to the day that Beckett finds the body of a newborn baby in a gym bag. Jake's gym bag. On the floor of her high school locker room. As word leaks out, rumors that Beckett's the mother take off like wildfire in a town all too ready to believe in the worst of her. Realistic fiction. Chlorine Sky. A novel in verse about a young girl coming of age and stepping out of the shadow of her former best friend. Perfect for fans of Elizabeth Acevedo and Nikki Grimes's work. A Universe of Wishes, a We Need Diverse Books anthology. In the forced collaboration with We Need Diverse Books, 15 award-winning and celebrated diverse authors deliver stories about a princess without the need of a prince, a monster long misunderstood, memories that vanish with a spell, and voices that refuse to stay silent in the face of injustice. Girl on the Line. Life's tough when you don't expect to be living it, but now that Journey has a future, she apparently also has to figure out what that future is supposed to look like. Some days the pain feels fresh as that day, the day she attempted suicide. Her parents don't know how to speak to her, her best friend cracks all the wrong jokes, and her bipolar 2 disorder feels like it swallows her completely. But other days feel like revelations, like meeting the dazzling Edda, a city college student who is a world on to herself, or walking into the office of the volunteer hotline and discovering a community as simultaneously strong and broken as she is, or uncovering the light within herself that she didn't know existed. When You Look Like Us. From debut author Harris comes a timely gripping novel about a boy who must take up the search for his sister when she goes missing from a neighborhood where black girls disappear, where black girls disappearances are all too often overlooked. For fans of Jason Reynolds and Tiffany Jackson's work. This will be funny someday. 16 year old Izzy is used to keeping her thoughts to herself. In school where her boyfriend does the talking for her and at home where it's impossible to compete with her older siblings and high powered parents. When she mistakenly walks into a stand up comedy club and performs, the experience is surprisingly cathartic. After the show, she meets Mo, an inspiring comic who's everything Lizzie is not. Bold, confident, comfortable in her own skin. Mo invites Izzy to join her group of friends and introduces her to the Chicago open mic scene. The only problem? Her new friends are college students and, Itty tell, and Izzy tells them that she's one too. Now Izzy, the dutiful daughter and model student is sneaking out to perform stand-up with her friends and her controlling boyfriend is getting suspicious and her former best friend knows something weird is going on. One of the good ones. 
When teen social activist and history buff Kezi is killed under mysterious circumstances after attending a social justice rally, her devastated sister Happy and their family are left reeling in the aftermath. As Kizzy becomes another immortalized victim in the fight against police brutality, Happy begins to question the idealized way her sister is remembered. As perfect, angelic, and one of the good ones. Bedazzled. Rafi has a passion for bedazzling. Not just bedazzling, but sewing, stitching, draping, pattern making, all for creation. He's always chosen his art over everything and everyone else and is determined to make his mark at this year's biggest cosplay competition. If he can wow there, it could lead to sponsorship, then art school, and finally earning real respect for his work. There's only one small problem. Rafi's ex-boyfriend, Luca, is his main competition. Influence. After a video she made goes viral, everyone knows Delilah. And now she's in LA, Delilah's standing on the edge of something incredible. Everything is going to change. She just has no idea how much. Jasmine grew up in the spotlight. A child star turned media darling. The posts of her classic Lulu C rainbow skirt practically break the internet. But if the world knew who Jasmine really was, her perfect life, it'd be canceled. Fiona is so funny, the kind of girl for whom a crowd parts. No wonder she's always smiling, but on the inside, that girl is a hot mess. And when someone comes out of the shadows with a secret from the past, it's one that just won't embarrass Fiona. It'll ruin her. And who wouldn't want to be Scarlet? Just look at her Instagram. Scarlet isn't just styled to perfection. She is perfection. Scarlet has gorgeous, famous boyfriend named Jack, and there's a whole fan base about their ship. To everyone watching online, their, se their lives seem perfect. But are they really? Concrete Rose, which happens to be the prequel to Angie Thomas's The Hate You Give. Thomas revisits Garden Heights 17 years events, years before the events of The Hate You Give in an exploration of black boyhood and manhood. If there's one thing 17 year old Maverick knows, it's that a real man takes care of his family. As the son of a former gang legend, Mav does the only thing he knows how, dealing for the King Lords. With this money, he can help his mom who works two jobs while his dad's in prison. Life's not perfect, but with a fly girlfriend and a cousin who has his back, Mav's got everything under control. Until that is, Mav finds out he's going to be a father. Romance. Happily ever afters. 16-year-old Tessa has never felt like the protagonist in her own life. She's rarely seen herself reflected in the pages of romance novels she loves. The only place she's a true leading lady is in her own writing, in the swoony love stories she shares only with Caroline, her best friend and number one devoted reader. When Tessa is accepted into the creative writing program at a prestigious art school, she's excited to finally let her stories shine. But when she goes to her first workshop, the words are just gone. Fortunately, Caroline has a solution. Tessa just needs to find some inspiration in a real life love story of her own. Roman and Jewel. Jersey will do anything to land the lead role in Broadway's hottest new show, Roman and Jewel, a Romeo and Juliet inspired hip hopera featuring a diverse cast and modern twists on the play. But her hopes are crushed when she learns that megastar Chinny won the lead and Jersey has to be her understudy. Falling for the male lead Zeppelin is a terrible idea, especially once Jersey learns that Ginny wants him for herself. Star-crossed love always ends badly, but when a video of Jersey and Zepp practicing goes viral and the entire world weighs in on who should play Jewel, Jersey learns that while the price of fame is high, friendship, family, and love are priceless. Glimpsed. Charity is a fairy godmother. She doesn't wear a poofy dress or go around waving a wand, but she does make sure that the deepest desires of the student population at Jack London High School come true and she knows what they want even better than they do because she can glimpse their perfect futures. When Charity fulfills a glimpse that gets Vendaya crowned homecoming queen, it ends in disaster. Suddenly every wish Charity has ever granted is called into question. Has she really been helping people? Where do these glimpses come from anyway? And what if she's not getting the whole entire picture? The quantum weirdness of the almost kiss. 17-year-old Evie has always been too occupied with her love of math and frequent battles with anxiety to want to date. Besides, she's always found the idea of kissing to be a bit weird. But by senior year, thanks to therapy and friends, she's braver than before. 
maybe even brave enough to enter the national math and physics competition or flirt back with a new boy. Meanwhile, Evie's best friend, Caleb, has always been a little bit in love with her. So he's horrified when he's forced to witness Evie's meet cute with the new guy. Desperate, Caleb uses a online forum to capture Evie's interest and it goes a little too well. Now Evie wonders how she went from avoiding romance to having to choose between two, or is it three, boys. The meet cute project. Mia's friends love rom-coms. Mia hates them. They're silly, contrived, and not at all realistic. Besides, there are more important things to worry about, like how to handle living with her bridezilla sister, Sam, who's never appreciated Mia, and surviving junior year juggling every school club offered and acing all of her classes. So when Mia is tasked with finding a date to her sister's wedding, her options are practically non-existent. Mia's friends, however, have an idea. It's a little crazy, a little out there, and a lot inspired by the movies that they love that Mia begrudgingly watches too. Mia just needs to have her own meet cute. Science fiction. A complicated love story set in space. When Noah closes his eyes on Earth and wakes up on a spaceship called Curiosity just as it's about to explode, he's pretty sure things can't get much weirder. Boy, is he wrong. Trapped aboard the Curiosity are also DJ and Jenny, neither of whom remember how they even got aboard the ship. Together, the three face all the dangers of space, along with murder, aliens, the school dance, and one really, really bad day. But none of this can prepare Noah for the biggest challenge, falling in love. Speculative fiction, which includes fantasy and adventure. Unchosen. For Charlotte, the world ended twice. The first was when her childhood crush, Dean, fell in love with her older sister. The second was when Crimson, a curse spread through eye contact, turned the majority of humanity into flesh-eating monsters. Neither end of the world changed Charlotte. She's still in the shadows of her siblings. Her popular older sister, Harlow, now commands a force of survivors. And her talented younger sister, Vanessa, is the chosen one. Who, legend has it, can end the curse. When their settlement is raided by those seeking the chosen one, Charlotte makes a reckless decision to save Vanessa. She takes her own place as prisoner. Then word spreads across the seven seas that the chosen one has been found. Lore. Every seven years, the Agon begins. As punishment for a past rebellion, nine Greek gods are forced to walk the earth as mortals. They are hunted by the descendants of ancient bloodlines, all eager to kill a god and seize their divine power and immortality. Long ago, Lore fled that brutal world, turning her back on the hunt's promises of eternal glory after her family was murdered by a rival line. For years, she's pushed away any thought of revenge against the man, now a god, responsible for their deaths. Yet as the next haunt dawns over New York City, two participants seek her out. Castor, a childhood friend Lore believed to be dead, and Athena, one of the last original gods, now gravely wounded. The goddess offers an alliance against their mutual enemy and a way to leave the Aegon behind forever. But Lore's decision to rejoin the hunt, binding her fate to Athena's, will come at a deadly cost. And it may not be enough to stop the rise of a new god with the power to bring humanity to its knees. A Vow So Bold and Deadly, which is the third novel in the Curse Breaker series. Ember Fall is crumbling fast, torn between those who believe Ren is the rightful prince and those who are eager to begin a new era under Grey, the true heir. Grey has agreed to wait two months before attacking Emberfall, and in that time, Ren has turned away from everyone, even Harper, as she desperately tries to find him a path to peace. Meanwhile, Leah struggles to rule with a gentler hand than her mother. But after enjoying decades of peace once magic was driven out of their lands, some of their subjects are angry that Leah has an enchanted prince and a magical scarver by her side. As Grey's deadline draws near, Leah questions if she can be the queen her country really needs. Into the Heartless Wood. Deep in the wood lives a witch queen and her eight tree sire and daughters. For centuries, they have harvested souls to feed the heartless tree, using its power to grow their ever-reaching kingdom of ash, birch, and oak. Owen Merrick lives at the edge of the forest, mapping the stars for the king in his father's observatory. For years, he has resisted venturing over the garden wall, until one day he must enter the woods to find his missing sister. But one of the witch's tree sire and daughters, Saren, decides to save his life instead of end it. Now, no matter how hard he tries, he can't stop thinking about her. Every night he goes into the wood to meet her and their love for each other grows. But when the constellations shift, 
The stars foretell an inevitable war between the witch queen and the king. Will Saren be compelled to fight for her mother and Owen forced to join the king's army? Or will they be plunged into the heart of a conflict that seemingly no one can win and might destroy both of their kingdoms forever? Ravens, which is the first book in the Ravens series. At first glance, the sisters of ultra-exclusive Kappa Rho Nu, the Ravens, seem like typical sorority girls. Ambitious, beautiful, and smart, they're the most powerful girls on Westerly College's Savannah, Georgia campus. But the Ravens just aren't regular sor sorority girls. They're also witches. Scarlet has always known she's a witch, and she's determined to be the sorority's president, just like her mother and sister before her. But if a painful secret from her past ever comes to light, she could lose absolutely everything. Vivi has no idea she's a witch, and she's never lived in one place long enough to make a friend. So when she gets a coveted bid to pledge the Ravens, she vows to do whatever it takes to become part of this magical sisterhood. The only thing standing in her way is Scarlet, who doesn't think Vivi is Raven's material. But when a dark power rises on campus, the girls will have to put their rivalry aside to save their fellow sisters. Someone has discovered the Ravens' secret, and that someone will do anything to see these witches burn. We Free the Stars, book two in the Sands of Ariwaya series. The battle on Shar is over, the Ars has fallen, Altair might be captive, but Zephira, Nyasir, and Kifa are bound for the Sultan's keep, determined to finish the plan that Altair set in motion, restoring the hearts of the sisters of old and bringing magic back to all of Arawaya. Cast in Firelight, the first book in the Wickery series. Adra is a royal heir of Belwar, a talented witch on the cusp of taking her royal ceremony test and a girl who just wants to prove her worth to her people. Jaten is a royal heir to the Napur, a competitive wizard who's mastered all nine courts of magic and a boy anxious to return home for the first time since he was a child. Together, their arranged marriage will unite two of Wickery's most powerful kingdoms. But after years of rivalry from afar, they only agree on one thing, their reunion will be anything but sweet. But destiny has other plans, and with the criminal underbelly of Belwar suddenly making a move for control, their paths cross, and neither realizes who the other is, adapting separate secret identities instead. Between dodging deathly spells and keeping their true selves hidden, the pair must learn to put their trust in each other if either is to uncover the real threat. Now Wickery's fate is in the hands of rivals? Fiancés? Partners? Whatever they are, it's complicated and bound for greatness or destruction. And those are all of our new books you can find in the library that came in in January. If any of them sound interesting and you'd like to place them on hold, feel free to email me at teen at aapld.org with your library card number and the title, and I'll get them on hold for you for pickup inside at the drive through or the branch. Also of note, if you are a teen who needs volunteer hours and loves to read, email me to learn how you can earn volunteer hours by reviewing books, including any of the ones shown here, plus many, many more. And we can get you started earning some hours by doing reviews. So thank you for joining us for this episode of Get Yeti to Read. And we'll be back shortly with all the new books that are coming in February. So until then, enjoy the rest of your week and I'll see you guys later. Thanks for watching. Bye.